Well, hello, everyone. Hello, my friend, Damian Roland. Uh, thanks for your time. This is a, like a special uh, episode of my podcast called Sesgos, which means bias in Spanish. Uh, well, I fortunately uh, living in summer right now and you are in winter. So I'm very jealous, very yeah, jealous. I guess so. So I wanted to talk today with you. You are a fabulous researcher. You are a fabulous clinician. You, you are a really lead clinician in your country, England. And you are your area of research and clinical duties is in the emergency department. You are, are the very beginning of the front line. You, you take care of the very sick children and those who are not very sick children in the emergency department. So from some weeks ago, I have uh, been reading you on your Twitter account about some things that have been worrying uh, in England. And this thing that you, you would tell me that if you know it about before, this group A streptococcus. Do you know him? Yeah, well, so so thank you for your, your kind introduction. Um, I, I I probably have a bit of an imposter syndrome about kind of my my clinical skills, uh, but but I do enjoy talking on podcasts. So so I'll give you that one. Um, so oh, group A strep. Um, well, what do we what do we know? So we knew before the pandemic. In, in fact, we we knew well before the pandemic that there was this condition called Streptococcus pyogenes probably lives as a commensal in a lot of people's throats and skin anyway, maybe 20, maybe 30% of the population. We know that it can make you a bit unwell and can give you this condition called scarlet fever um, and scarlet fever combination, sore throat, fever, and this, this rash that, that go, goes all over the body. I, I, I want to highlight here one of, one of the things that has improved in medicine over time is the acknowledgement of different ethnicities uh, and cultures. So what's quite clear to me is we've gone from comms, which just talks about a red rash, to appreciating that um, parts of the population, such as those with Afro-Caribbean skin types, you won't see a red rash. Uh, and we, we, we have to ha be better in our, our comms uh, describing some of these things on different skin tones. And that's a definite improvement now yeah. compared to, to three to four uh, years ago. Um, but so we, we know scarlet fever comes in surges. We knew in, I think it was 2007 and 18, there was loads of it uh, in the UK. We're not entirely sure why. Um, and one of the weird things is, and I, I learned this from uh, Alison Munro, is that it seems that even before antibiotics started, there was loads of kind of strep around which had high mortality. And that seemed to get better even before antibiotics came in. And now we've got antibiotics, we can now treat scarlet fever. But when we're treating scarlet scarlet fever, all we're really doing is reducing transmission and maybe the length of illness or a day or two. If we don't treat scarlet fever, you're going to get better anyway. Anyway, um, now, whether there, you use antibiotics or not. Not, yes. Yeah. Now, there are parts of the world where some high risk groups are very susceptible. So if I was having this conversation in Australia, it would be very different. In the UK, we have very low numbers of, of high risk groups. Um, and so previously, what we've done is gone, well, OK, we get this surge uh, of, of um, uh, group A strep every year. If you've got scarlet fever, we'll treat it to stop it spreading. And we accept this very small proportion will get seriously unwell with invasive group A strep. Invasive group A strep is a dreadful disease. If you've worked in the emergency department or ICU like yourself, you will have seen children come in moderately unwell and then be ventilated, if not die, sometimes within hours, sometimes in front of your face. It is a truly horrendous disease. But the challenge that we've got at the moment is the fear of this being a truly horrendous disease against the tiny proportion of children who actually become unwell with it. This is such a difficult media narrative well, balance. We are talking right now because many headlines in red letters about children dying in England from this scarlet fever disease related and this 
in some media, even they say that it's a new bacteria. Uh, I mean, ignorance in media, it's common, of course. Yep. But these headlines, of course, uh, fuel panic all around the world. If one or two kids die in London, say London or Leicester, where you are, uh, people reading those headlines here in Montevideo, so far away, will ask their pediatricians if they have, or if they if their child started with fever, if they have or not the disease that is killing children in, in the UK. How do you ambition these kind of things besides the streptococcus after the pandemic? How do you think it has changed our collective mindset in this? And what would be our role as pediatricians and as doctors in communicating how to be careful when a child is uh, feverish, but in, 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 in particular, how can we be better in not uh, fueling panic all around the world? I mean, that's an, it's a, a brilliant question. So we, we know fever phobia has already existed. It's, it's actually, it's a well-defined, quantified thing. Different cultures have it to different extents, but all over the world, pre-COVID, there was an abnormal obsession with fever. To be honest, there's been an abnormal obsession with fever, even within pediatricians. <laughs> so yeah. let, let, let's not yeah. be, take the moral high ground. Healthcare professionals can be just as bad as parents and, and carers can be. Um, and there's a lot of education. If, if I had my time as prime minister, I would insert in schools curriculum, you have to do English, you have to do maths, you have to do humanities, and you have to do healthcare. Healthcare should be a subject. You should leave school knowing the basics of a lot of uh, uh, conditions. Um, and I think How that would really help. You have to wash your hands. Yes. <laughs> what, what you have to do when you get sick and so on. All these things, we, we, we don't teach people enough about them. Now, the problem is, is COVID has amplified everyone's fears. Um, and, and it's done, it's not, it's psychologically done that. I think the the resilience, and I hate the term resilience, but the resilience of our population, having been through the last couple of years, is slightly lower than it would be anyway. And we are just worried about any infection now. So, and then we add in an infection, which is defined by fever and being unwell, and you can see the mass panic that, that ensues from that. And, it, and it's really difficult. Some of the, the learning, I think some specialists in healthcare communication will tell you um, that actually the more you speak about something, the worse it gets. Uh, I personally, I find this really difficult. Um, as you know, I enjoy talking. Yeah. <laughs> I enjoy communicating. And I find it frustrating when actually communications about events are reduced or, or people don't want to go on the media. But it, it is interesting and when I speak to other communications professionals, um, and I have to acknowledge that if a communication professional told me how to do my job in an emergency department, I'd be really annoyed. Yeah. Uh, and so I have to respect <laughs> the fact that I can't, it's not for me to tell communication professionals how to do their job, but that we, we need to work together, I think, a little more closely on some of the communications me uh, messages that come out. But particularly in the UK at the moment, we've got a lot of work to do about readjusting parental expectation um, around minor illness. And one of the things, uh, speaking to a number of colleagues, is resetting parental responsibility. And this is a really difficult narrative. Yes. Um, and I apologise to parents and carers who might be listening to this podcast. But my feeling is, is that there, over time there has been a sense of actually... I want to take, if I'm worried about my child, I need someone else to take a bit of responsibility for that. Mm. And I think that there is something about how we empower parents and carers to be more confident in the decision making that they are. Um, and I might not have explained that very well, but I, I do think that there is a, a social phenomenon going on here. Um, and we have too many families presenting because they're worried what will happen if they make a mistake about their child. And even though they might not be actually that worried about how unwell their child is. I, I hope education, education and education. But, well, I today, early in the morning, 
I read another newspaper and they were talking about this triple epidemic, RSV, flu, COVID. So we used to call it winter. <laughs> I love that. Right? No, that's, that's right? So we, we, call, we used to call it winter. And we healthcare workers are used to every winter suffer the way you are suffering right now, the beginning of the winter. Try to explain those parents that how is your job right now or in your job right now? Because yeah. I'm in the summer, I'm trying to <laughs> think about, <laughs> about what, uh, the, the kind of things that we like to do in summer. And RSV, fortunately, uh, has gone away. I will start uh, talking <laughs> slowly about this. Uh, but does this triple epidemic exceed? What, what is it? When you so, read these headlines, what do you think? So, yeah, I, I like your, your frame that actually the triple epidemic is, is winter. I suppose, to be fair, the worry is the combination simultaneously. Now, I can only speak for the UK here, and, uh, and yeah. I can only really speak for, for my experience. But what, what happened pre-COVID is that we had our summer, and then in September, we had a spike of rhinovirus when kids went back to school. That rhinovirus would push attendances for wheeze and asthma, and we'd see a spike in wheeze and asthma in September. As that filtered away, we would then get an RSV spike, which was around November, December time. Mm -hmm. And then that would fade off and we'd get a spike of flu. Uh, probably January, February time, which really hit adults, adults much harder than children. Um, and then we'd go into spring, we'd get a bit of gastroenteritis, and then we'd go into the summer. Um, and so what people have been worried about this year is that those different viruses, rather than being spread out throughout winter, would merge and would hit children and adults all at the same time. And I, and we are beginning to see a bit of evidence for that. Okay. And also, what we normally have is the the the, uh, the streptococcal surge normally comes a bit later than it has done this year. And the graphs are quite clear about this. We have the highest numbers of scarlet fever and invasive group A strep cases than we've ever had at this type of year. But those numbers are still less than the peak in 2017. Now, this Before is the interesting the thing. Yeah, that we've had the the number of deaths we've had in children is half the number that we had in the peak of 2017. Okay. Um, now, does that mean that this is uh, what we don't know is how long this peak's going to go on for? So, if this peak stutters out, it may well be all that's happened is we've had a much shorter earlier peak, and in fact, that's what happened for RSV last year in the UK. We or no, it wasn't shortened, but we had all the RSV came over the summer months in the summer. Yeah, I and, recall. and then it yeah. petered out as we were. It, it didn't go away completely, but it changed when it came. Now this year, RSV is hit when it normally hits, kind of the the October, November, December time period. But the eye gas has moved forward a bit, so we're dealing with both RSV and eye gas, um, and we're seeing a bit of flu. So when people talk about this triple threat. I, I think what they're saying, it's not really, it's not different bugs. It's just that they're all merging at the same time. And that's what one of the problems is. And why? Do you have any explanation for this? Because we are used to these surges, normal surges within one, two, three viruses, bacteria after them, or at the same time. But during the last couple of years, before 2021, perhaps, we have none lockdowns all around the world, the midst of the uh, social isolation. So we didn't have RSV seem to disappear. Uh, so to understand why these searches have moved along the, the, the year, um, they arise when, when we don't expect them. What are today your explanation for this phenomenon? What are the theories, at least? Yeah. So I mean, it's, a, it's a real shame. This has become quite a toxic debate uh, amongst researchers. Um, and it's become a toxic debate, I think, because 
in some ways, social media has taken away people's ability to spend a lot of time reading what people say, understand it, and then feedback constructively. And it all revolves around what you understand by the term immune debt. Yeah. Uh, and this immune debt is like a bomb. If you put hashtag immune debt into Twitter or social media at the moment, people go berserk uh, because they presume you know what you think you know by you mean by it when th th they might not do or you might not be using it in the same way. My understanding, and, I, and again, I'm clear here, I am a humble pediatric emergency medicine clinician. I do not have a background in epidemiology. I do not have a background in vi virology, no. and I do not have a background in molecular biology. I can Neither. only tell you what I experience. And what happened is, is that every year we get our wave of RSV that comes uh, in the winter months because a population of children have no uh, immunity to RSV. I don't think that is a controversial statement. Um, and the children who have experienced RSV in the past are relatively protected from it because they have RSV antibodies from their previous infection. I hope that that, again, is not a controversial statement. In uh, the COVID pandemic, during lockdown, we re completely removed the transmission of RSV. Yeah. So we have a group of children who, at, at a small uh, at, at small months of age, um, didn't aren't exposed to RSV. And what we need to understand, and I think some people don't quite get this, is some children become really symptomatic with bronchiolitis. Some children don't become that symptomatic, but both children develop, get antibodies. So there are lots of children every winter who get exposed to bronchiolitis, who develop immunity to it, and you might not know that they've even been that ill. But last, in the COVID pandemic, no one got the, the antibodies. And what happened was as soon as the virus started circulating again because people were mixing, we had a much greater proportion of children yeah. who were without susceptible antibodies. without yeah. antibodies. And so people became unwell as soon as that happened. And that's why we saw people becoming unwell over the summer, because previously, if they'd been exposed to it, they had antibodies and it wasn't a problem. And this year it was. There are some people who are utterly Same convinced. happened with parents, right? And mothers. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. Who do not go, got ill during the pandemic. I yep. mean... Everyone says RSV is a kid uh, thing, but no, many thousands of adults, older adults, die from RSV each year. And yeah, especially those adults, the elderly and, population. Yeah, yeah and uh, children are not the only reservoirs for RSV. You know, their yes. parents, their grandparents are as well. So, what are the clinical implications for this? Because everyone say, well, now you have three, four. Please go and you can shut down that school because those are the places uh, and we we know them and we have been working about this. We have in a way normalized that closing the schools. You, it's, it's like a public health tool that you can uh, use every time you it's like a mind, new mindset uh, thanks to the horrible pandemic we uh, we have lived. So we have this triple epidemic, so go, please. And many, many professionals are saying, well, perhaps we have to close to the schools again. What do you think about this? I mean, what are the clinical implications for these changes in the searches and uh, from, from as a clinician and, uh, and from the public health perspective in your view? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that has frustrated me uh, about the pandemic and some scientists view on it um, is that they've been very protective against COVID. Now, COVID, please do not get me wrong. It is a terrible disease. It yes. has caused monumental loss of life, has caused tragedy. And there are so many children in the world today who do not have parents and grandparents because of COVID. So, so it is a dreadful disease. But pre-COVID, we had bronchiolitis, we've had eye gas, we've had lots of respiratory viruses, which are equally impactful on children that hospitalize and can kill children to a, to a certain extent. 
And people prior to the, the pandemic were not calling for hugely radical measures to prevent the transmission of these viruses. Um, and while I understand the need to protect adults, we, the people calling to protect children from these viruses have not done so for other viruses previously. And I find that a bit confusing. And actually the most important care that we can give to children is give them love and give them an education. And they should be our two top things. And yes, we will have circulating viruses. And yes, it may well be that some schools might encourage a bit more spread than would have happened. But the important thing is love and education. And closing a school before you try and reduce some of the things that adults do in the reservoir just makes no sense whatsoever, especially given what we've we've done in the past in terms of being very happy with lots of viruses spreading each winter. Um, so I, I, I see no reason to start closing schools ever again, because there are so many other things that we can do that, that could protect children before we do that. Are you afraid that it might be the case someday? So there's already a petition on the UK website saying we should we should close schools early to stop the the streptococcal infection spreading further. And and to be fair, I'm I don't want to be dismissive because if you're a parent who's lost a child through eye gas, or that you're an affected, you know someone who has, I, I get you will be absolutely terrified. It, it mm. must be a horrendous thing to happen. Yeah. One of the sad things that, that I must do as a responsible researcher and scientist is I have to look at populations. I have to look at society as a whole. And I have to say that the what we need to be doing is doubling our efforts to remove children from as much risk as possible, but in a sustainable and safe way. And the way we do that is get children out of poverty and deprivation. The way it just cl closing schools is not the way to do it. And we know that, for example, streptococcus in crowded spaces live very well in poverty yeah. population, in poor yeah. population. So if you want to combat, in a way, yeah. streptococcus disease, you have Get to... Get children out of poverty. Do not chill close schools. Damian, what are your reflections for parents right now? For UK parents, for, but from parents all around the world, you you have been doing research about screening of severe disease from long time ago, from every, in particular, infections that we know that infections kill many people all around. What are your recommendations? What would you say right now in this environment, in this hostile environment, particularly in social media? in uh, journalism with these uh, horrifying headlines, what would you say to them as a pediatrician who, are, who is right now taking care of children? So I think there's a couple of things. The first thing I, I try and tell parents and carers to do is, please do not wait until your child is ill to find the resources that you need to help you. If you're listening to this podcast, when it finishes, go away, find a book, find a website, find an app, find a podcast, start looking at where your resources are for what you do if your child has a fever, a cough, diarrhea and vomiting. Don't leave it to the panicked moment when your child is actually ill. Be prepared. Find yes. the resource that helps you. That might be some a written page. It might be a website. It might be a video. Find a source of information that suits you, but do that reading before your child is ill. Through that reading, you'll start understanding that the critical difference to me, uh, and all, I think this is the, the second piece of advice I give to all parents and carers, is I am interested in your perception of your child's illness, not the symptoms they have. So when you come and see me, if you give me a long list of, I'm worried about my child's fever, I'm worried about my child's cough, um, I am less concerned. If you start, if you bring the child in and go, my child's got a fever and cough, but I'm worried about them. 
there's something wrong with my child. My child. That yeah. is the key thing. It That's is the feeling. behavior of your child and the gut feeling you have of your child. If you were just worried about the symptom, it is highly unlikely that your child is going to be unwell. Now, there's a caveat to that. Obviously, if your child is less than three months old with a fever, I have to make it clear that is the one exception to that rule. <laughs> but otherwise, yeah. um, particularly is, if, you, if it is your first child, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, but if you um, the, 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 the key thing for me is trying to, to disavow this feeling that the symptom can do harm. Fever is a good thing. Fever is your body fighting the infection and that you all you need to manage is the distress of your child. The third thing I will say is I, I understand your your frustration, your anger and your fear. Okay. I have to balance the individual parents and carers' anger, frustration, and fear with the needs of all the people who come to my emergency department. And if all parents occur simultaneously with minor concerns, I can't provide safe care. Mm -hmm. If everyone presents at the same time, it's impossible to find that what we call a needle in the haystack, the yeah. child who is actually um, unwell. The, hay um, the haystack becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, bigger yes. and even bigger. <laughs> yeah. So um, to, to try to scream for that tiny fraction of children, really, really sick, who who need uh, quick attention and, and health care, won't, won't be, we won't be uh, able to be provide able to find them. them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and part of the that happens is if you do make it to a healthcare consultation is is being listened to and feeling listened to. And I, I think there's two aspects here. As a, a, a profession, so any doctors or, and, uh, and nurses or other healthcare professionals who see children, we have to understand that parents and carers want to be listened to and they want to be heard. Okay? And if we are dismissive, we create problems for ourselves in the future. Because once a parent or carer feels that they've been judged or fobbed off, that makes their future healthcare consultations harder. Um, and so I think there is an action on healthcare professionals themselves to yeah. take that time to really listen to be what's told to them and um, and address what the anxiety is, even if you have to be quite blunt about it. And I think sometimes we're afraid of telling parents what we really think. We're not being mean or critical, but I think you, you sometimes have to spell things out quite clearly to families about what is a concern and what isn't. Parents and ca carers on, on their behalf um, need to be able to raise their concerns in a way that that, that does get, um, uh, get get listened to it. And this is where it becomes really complex because if you listen to the families where tragedy occurs, they almost always describe presenting what they, something that they have seen that is not right and that the clinician telling them that that's okay. Mm. And this is the difficulty that, that we have because those stories spread and they, they spread really yeah. quickly. And we end up with the impression that healthcare professionals never listen, which, which isn't true, um, but also that some fears are, are not worth raising, again, which, which, which isn't true. So my, my advice to parents and carers is sometimes just being quite honest. I'm really sorry, Dr. So-and-so, I'm presenting to my concerns and I don't think you're listening to me. Oh. And be quite averse about that. Yeah. Tell the doctor that you don't feel that you're being listened to. Now, what will happen, I think, in 90% of cases, that will be a quite, oh, the healthcare professional will go, okay, that, that's a bit odd, okay? Yeah, I better yeah. restart and reframe this consultation. Now, unfortunately, I know a small proportion of, of colleagues won't take that very well, uh, if I'm, and that's really sad. And I think that that is going to cause conflict. But actually, the majority of the time, I think if you're quite clear, if you say, I don't feel listened to, I think the, 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 the hospital or, or family practitioner will reframe what they're saying because they they understand what they're saying isn't having the effect it needs to have now the key thing here and this is the problem we have parents and carers we must li always listen to parents and carers aren't always right now sometimes they are and mm -hmm. and 
we there's research and I'm doing this research and lots of other colleagues are doing research is how do we work out when parental anxiety is right or when when it's just parental anxiety yeah. and, and we are so far from understanding that at the moment we need to put more money and more emphasis and involve more parents and carers in understanding why it is that some parents and carers have amazing gestalt or tacit knowledge they know there's something wrong with their child and then that and another parent is utterly obsessed that there's something wrong with their child and there's nothing wrong with them we, uh, why is that we, we don't know and we need to work much harder at working out what what is going on there but how do you manage to find the time in an overcrowded er to take that minute to listen to parents to have this uh, quiet conversation no. how how do you manage because Emergency departments are a wild place to be and a wild place to be working as a pediatrician. I admire you in a way because I, in the ICU, I, I know how many patients I have. I mean, it can be rough, of course, particularly in winter, but I always look at my colleagues in the ER, uh, how, many, how they can manage to, to live in this environment. Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. And I think a lot of my colleagues would say when we're overwhelmed, you can't give parents and carers the time that they need. And, and that's why overcrowded departments are dangerous. That's yeah. why we make mistakes, because we don't have the time to address the family's needs. One of the things, and, and, I, and I, I do this a lot with my juniors. Um, so a, a junior doctor will come to me and will, will tell me a history. They'll tell me all the signs and symptoms. They may even give me a management plan. Uh, and what I'll say to them is, what does the mother or father think of your plan? And mm. they'll look at me as if, I, if I'm mad. And I'll go, no. so, so what, do they agree with you? Uh, are, are they anxious, upset? Um, and th again, they'll look at me quizzically. And I'll go back into the room. And it's quite clear that the mother and father are utterly up the wall. They're beside themselves with anxiety. And that body language has been completely missed. Yes. And there's lots of things that I am absolutely and these are like, like yeah. these or, or, arms. Or, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, th th and there's lots of things that I am rubbish at. I think the thing that keeps me, I, I hope keeps me safe, is what I try and do is read parental body language and address concern where even if the parent thinks it's not being addressed. And that's how you do it quickly. From the very outset, yeah. you try and identify what it is the parent is really concerned about and address that. Because as soon as you do that, it becomes a much safer consultation. Damian, last question. And you can go to see those 20, 30, or perhaps 40 children waiting for your <laughs> help. What have you learned from the pandemic? Uh, you as a parent, as a clinician, and the second question is, have we, as a modern society, learned something or the next pandemic we will do the same kind of uh, wild things? Okay. Um, so I've, I've learned loads for the, the, the pandemic. Uh, so one of the things I learned is the importance of actually uh, spending time with your family as a group. Um, I'm ashamed to say that during the first lockdown, uh, in the UK, we had periods where you're only allowed to go out for one period of exercise a day. Cool. And what that meant was, is that we could get, we went out for family as a walk and we, we did that every day. And that, that became quite a big thing. Um, and it made me really appreciate my family far more than I had done before. That's really sad uh, uh, in retrospect, but I, I was a real powerful learning uh, for yeah. me as a clinician who sometimes find the finds the balance work this work I don't know what work-life balance thing is but I sometimes find it difficult um so that was one thing um I I do believe that we, we've we we've learned a lot about healthcare communication especially how to get healthcare communication wrong okay. um and we we need to improve many that. times you you have to learn what not to do yes yeah yeah um and I think I do worry that if we get a pandemic again, we're not going to enact some of the things that we did learn. We've become really good operationally. 
I think we've become quite good at how to mobilize services quickly, how to change the direction of tack, how to move staff around. We're, we're brilliant at that. How, how do we communicate with the public effectively? Uh, how do we get our research out in a way that is robustly peer reviewed, that is disseminated in the correct way? We, have we learned anything in the last couple of years? Perhaps not. Uh, and that's a real shame. Frustrating. Yeah. Damian, you have been really nice. I always learn from you. And uh, I repeat, you are a voice of reason that it's really uh, recommended to be here uh, from all standpoints. So thanks well, that, for your that, time today. And have a not so wild winter in the north. <laughs> I'll try. Thank you very much for your, for your kind words and for your time. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Bye bye, Damien. Okay, bye bye.